Uh, without any further ado, uh, Kat Zhang. Well then, that was a good attempt at pronouncing my weird name. Um, <laughs> hi everyone. Um, I know this is like the last talk before the keynote, before the social, but bear with me. Thank you for coming. Uh, I promise there will be beer in my talk. Um, so let's have a bit more fun before we get to the keynote uh, and everything else. Let me just double check that I know where my mouse is, because that will be handy. So, how do you structure your go ups? Who here has had this question at least once in their life? Not surprised, right? Not surprised. I think everybody who starts out with Go, and even after you've been going, doing Go for a while, uh, it's a very common question. It's probably one of the first questions that you ask. Probably some of these questions pop to your mind. So when I started out, I was like, OK, do I put everything just in the main package? Do I start out with one package and then break out into packages over time and just kind of trust the organic growth of, of my app? Um, how do you decide when something should be in its own package? Uh, should you just use a framework and let that take care of that? Um, what's the actual sort of idiomatic Go uh, recommendation for structure? Is there such a thing? Uh, should you go towards microservices? Should you start with a monolith? When, you know, how do you decide? Uh, how much should you share between packages? Should your packages be completely independent, even if it means uh, some copy and paste, or is you know is there a sensible way of sharing some things and splitting them up? And I think that's that's th those are some very common questions for new and experienced developers alike. Um, application structure is not mentioned or discussed that often. There are some resources online, but it's not really something that you can find a lot on uh, online. Um, Everyone seems to have a slightly different answer to this. Everyone seems to have their own preferences, which is completely fine. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be like a unanimous, this is how you do Go, uh, and this is how you structure things in Go. And Go as a language doesn't really give you many hints. I mean, it doesn't really steer you in any particular way, which is great, because you can just experiment and do whatever you want. But at the same time, it's not very intuitive. It might be hard for beginner programmers especially. It might be a slightly higher level of, of sort of barrier to enter, entry. So like I said, these are all the questions that I had myself as well. Uh, this is me in Iceland a month ago, like Mark mentioned. Um, I've been a software developer for about seven years now, so not a huge amount of experience. Um, and I've been doing Go for about two years full time. Um, so I wouldn't say I'm an expert. I don't consider myself an expert yet, but I've written some production apps already. Um, and so I started out with PHP and, then, and Java, and then I moved to Go. Uh, and I'm still fairly unsure about some things in Go, but I think over time I've kind of worked out some ideas for how you could structure your app or what are, what are the best practices that seem to be out there in the industry. So this is where the idea from, for this talk came, came about. It was like a very personal struggle that I had. Why should we care about structure? You might be thinking like, yeah, sure, but like, is, is this really important? Like, end of the day, if it works, it works, right? Well, Dave Cheney say, said, probably on this stage, because it was a keynote, uh, back in 2016 in, uh, at Golang UK, if Go is going to be a language that companies invest in for the long term, the maintenance of Go programs, the ease of which, with which they can change, will be a key factor in their decision to go with Go. Unavoidable pun. Um, so I was like, yeah, totally. Like, that makes sense. Like, maintainability of your project is a very big uh, factor when you're deciding about a language. And if you don't have a good structure for your projects, then you just find yourself with, inevitably with mess over time. And it would be very frustrating. And I think we've all been there, regardless of which programming language. I think we've all had come across projects which just didn't really have a structure, and it just felt very messy, and you didn't even know how to go about fixing it. So let's define what a good structure actually is. Um, I think it should, first and foremost, be consistent across the entire project. I think, and it really frustrates me, 
when there are several different styles in the same app. And as a newcomer to the application, not necessarily a newbie programmer, but just an app that you've never seen before, and you're not sure which, ones, which style you should follow, because you see, like, oh, this part is done this way, and this part is done this way. So like, which, which style should you stick to? I think your structure should be easy to navigate, easy to understand, and easy to reason about. So it, it basically should just make sense. By looking at the code, it should make sense to you. I think it should be easy to change, fairly loosely coupled. I think if you just wanted to make a small addition here, a small tweak here, you shouldn't really need to change the entire app suddenly. It should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And I really like this quote. I think, so this is attributed to Einstein. Uh, there's some debate around it. Um, I think this reflects the Go way of doing things, the idiomatic Go perfectly. So keep it sort of as simple as you can, but not simplistic. The design of your app should reflect exactly how the app works, because ultimately your code is the most up-to-date documentation of your software you'll ever have. So if the design reflects exactly how the software works, there is no wondering about, oh, but like, the docs say that it does this, but it doesn't seem to be doing this. So I think a good structure basically is the best version of the documentation for your software that you can have. And then conversely, the structure of your code should be what you set out to do in the first place. So like if you set out with a certain design, that structure should ideally achieve what you set out to do. So I said there will be some beer in this. There might not be actual beer, but there will be some beer in this talk. Uh, I like doing talks where I sort of talk about some real life examples or fairly realistic examples. I don't like doing talks where I just talk about foos and bars, because that's not what real life is. And we all know how to structure a simple, here's a foo class, here's a bar class, here's that, how they can make, how they may interact. But how do you go about reasoning about slightly bigger projects? So imagine I gave you this spec to implement. So let's say we want to implement a beer reviewing service service. So I want the user to be able to add a beer, um, add a review for a beer. I would like the users to be able to list all the beers. I'd like them to be uh, able to list a re all, re all reviews for a given beer. And just for the funsies, uh, let's say we want to have two options for storage, JSON files or in memory. And obviously, you could add as many as you want. Uh, and I also want um, the ability to add some sample data, so just to populate the whichever storage I pick with some sample beers and some sample reviews. So for, for simplicity, simplicity, like I said, we'll skip deletes, updates, uh, skip some tests, and skip some error handling. So obviously, this is just a demo up. <laughs> so let's have a look at a few different ways in which we could go about implementing this. And this is where my magical switching hopefully will happen. Whoops. I've gone the wrong way with the mouse, I think. There we go. So this is slightly blurry, but I will open these and then zoom in. Can you guys all see this, or should I work on zooming this in? Anyway, it doesn't really matter what's on this screen that much. I will zoom in for the important bits. So I have my main function, which basically all it does is calls populate beers and populate reviews, so populate the sample data. And it just creates a router, defines the routes. And the files that we have here is data go for the sample data. And we've got a model.go, which defines the review struct and the beer struct. Fairly intuitive. And we've got a storage.go, which defines the storage interface, because we, you know, probably some of you already jumped to the conclusion that because we have different types of storage, we should probably abstract that and have an interface for it. Um, and then the, the, the actual implementation, so we've got a storage JSON and storage memory for the two implementation. That is all sitting under one root directory, flat. It's all in the main package. So that's the most obvious way to start uh, with something like this. And the obvious pro is that it's easy to navigate. For a small app like this, I see no problem with just doing it in flat files. Um, it's the best way to avoid the risk of running into circular, de circular dependencies, because it's all in the main package. So you'll never run into that problem, which is good. Um, I think it's a good starting point. When you're not sure uh, what structure you should adopt, 
maybe starting with flat files is just the simplest way to start. And it's fairly easy to then go in, like start extracting packages over time. And so I think there's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with the, the keep it sweet and simple uh, approach. At least for, I think it works pretty well, maybe for up to like 10, 20 business op operations in your app. Um, I think you can still achieve it pretty nicely with flat files. Whoops, wrong way around. So, let me just go back with the mouse. This is just a summary of uh, what was in the editor. I've taken out the dependency files and all the nonsense, but essentially this is, this is sort of the gist of it. Looking at those files, can you tell just by looking at the names what this app does? I mean, you can probably guess it maybe is a server because it has a handlers that go storage JSON, storage mem. You can probably guess that it you know, has those two. But it doesn't actually tell you what this app does. It doesn't mention beers. It doesn't mention reviews. So you actually have to go into the code and open the files and look through the code to find out what this app actually is about. I think that flat files are great for smaller apps. For bigger apps, they can be hard to navigate over time, especially once those files start to grow large or if you just suddenly have to start having 20, 30, 40 files. That's the downside. Um, you also kind of it's easy to use global state in this structure, and that might be slightly risky uh, because global state is generally discouraged, and that stru this structure doesn't really prevent you or discourage you from, from using it. So let's see if we can maybe break this up or like somehow group those, those things together. Grouping by function. What do I mean by that? Um, this is something called the layered architecture. And you essentially divide your code into three or however many layers. You start with the sort of some, of some of the things have to do with presentation and the user interface layer. Some of the things have to do with business logic, like the core logic of your app. Some of the files are for external dependencies, like databases or whatever third party things you might be talking to. So if I now maybe jump to the Editor. Just close all these things. There we go. So I've got essentially three directories um, handlers, models, and storage. Because you know, some, some of these, these things are to do with the server and the endpoints and the handlers. Um, the models, which is the essential, the sort of structs, the beers and the reviews, and then the storage. So inside of Inside each, it's just a few files. So storage has JSON and memory. Models have beer, review, and storage. So these just define the structs. It's just that they're now in their own files. And then the handlers just have um, the actual HTTP handlers. So get beer, add beer, and so on and so forth. There's this thing, thing still, I still have a file called data.go that is kind of really hard to put somewhere because, like, where does the sam sample data go? It doesn't it's kind of like just outside of everything. I mean, could maybe go with the models, but not quite. Not quite with the handlers. So I've just left it in the main, in the root directory. Uh, and then the main just kind of ties it together. So main pretty much does the same thing. So calls the populating and then just creates the HTTP router. So all of this might look familiar to you, because all, all this stuff like controllers, models, views, DAOs, that's a classic MVC. So we probably all know this from other languages or other frameworks. Um, the pros of that approach um, is that it's easy to decide where, what goes where. I mean, unless you've got something like the data, which is a bit ambiguous. But generally, if you've got a handler, put it in handlers. If you've got a model, put it in models. So it's fairly easy to decide, especially if you're just coming into the app, what should go where. The globals might start to be a bit problematic, because you might now have to share um, some things between different packages, and so you might have to start passing things into your structs. So for example, if you create like a database um, uh, like in instance of a struct or something, and then that needs to be used by the beers and the reviews, you kind of have to start passing that in. So the global state is kind of slightly, prob you, start, you have to start passing things more. Um, still, looking at this, even though you've got the, it kind of gives you a slightly 
better idea of what the app does. Because even though the package names don't really tell you what the app does, once you look into the, the packages to see the names of the files, you can kind of see B, review, storage. It still doesn't tell you what you can do with this app. But it kind of tells you a little bit more about what, what it's about. There are some other things like naming dile dilemmas that start creeping in here. So um, if you've got your models, let's say you've, you had like a user model. Do you call it users or user? So it's the whole singular, plural. And do they all go in one file? Do you have separate ones for users and for user, or like separate one for beers and a separate one for beers? So you might have some start having dilemmas like this. And this kind of is also hard to extend over time, because once you have 10 or 20 different handlers and 20, 50, however many models, like those directories, those layers, those packages just start growing uncontrollably. And you kind of get to the point where they all group completely different things together. So that's a slight downside. The biggest problem about this particular app, though, and uh, probably quite a few of, of apps like this, is that this won't actually compile because you've got circular dependencies. In this case, uh, our uh, beer model, sorry, our handlers, they depend on the storage to add beers. So they, they, they depend on the storage uh, package to save the beers. But then the storage package depends on the models because they save the beers and they use the beer uh, struct from the models the package. So they use this struct here. Um, and so you've got a circular dependency between those three, that storage depends on models. That depends on storage, because you have a storage interface, which is in the models, because it just defines an interface. That calls some storage package memory things. And then that calls um, the models, so the beer models. So you've got a dependency between the storage package and the, uh, and the models package. And that's a circular dependency. And if you tried to compile it, uh, it would just say, I can't. So that's the biggest downside. Sorry, I've gone the wrong way again. There we go. Let's go back to this one. Cool. So, how about we try grouping by module? Um, so for example, beers, reviews, and storage, but like in a slightly different, so, so take the, the modules uh, and actually name the packages after that. So rather than the function, uh, it's more about like the module, the group of it. So I've got that in here, whoops. So the packages are now beers, uh, database or storage, forgot to rename it, and reviews. Let's close these ones. How does that look inside? So we've kind of grouped the handlers and the models together. because So now everything that is about beers goes into that package. And everything that is about reviews goes into that package. Everything that is about the storage goes in here. So you've got the gener generic struct definition as well as the implementations. Uh, and then main, again, ties it all together. Uh, pretty much doesn't really change. So same thing, populating, and then just creating the routers. Um, so the naming is kind of worse in this case, because you've got a beers.beer. And that's the stutter that you generally should try and avoid and go. So in this, in this particular example, like it just get, gets harder with the naming, because now you've got reviews, review, and you've got storage, storage, or database storage. So the naming isn't particularly pretty in this case. Um, and it's hard to decide as well whether reviews really belong in their own package, or do they belong in beers, because it's technically reviews of the beer. So you could argue both ways. You could argue that it's its, its own thing, or it's actually like a sub module of beers. Um, and then that is slightly, it might be slightly hard to decide then like whether, you know, what's a top level package and what's like a sub package of another package. Um, you also have circular dependencies in here. Um, and I think it's the exact same one. So I think database depends on the uh, beers, I think. Yeah, so you've got the beers and reviews here. And then the beer and the handler actually. Um, 
depends on the storage here. So you've also got circular dependencies between those packages because they're all just treated equal and at, as the same, at the same level. So this also won't compile. Um, and then you also have like some weird other naming clashes. Like if you've got, um, we've got a JSON as the storage type. And then in our JSON, in the actual JSON implementation, I had to name it JSON storage because I couldn't name the struct and the constant for the type JSON because that would be a name clash. So you get some kind of, if you basically throw different things under the same module and those things might need the same name, that might lead to some problems. And it's still hard to know what this app does or where I should use what. Like if I open up the handler function um, and start looking at the functions, I still don't quite know. Like if I, if I just wanted to add a review, I'd have to look at the code to figure out, you know, is my add review function going to be in this package or in this package? So it's not very intuitive to know like how should I use this code um, if I just wanted to call a function. So it kind of does get rid of some problems, but replaces them with others compared to the, funct to the like, functional split. How about we try and group it by context? So go one step further again. Uh, what do I mean by context? If we come back to the spec, um, let's think about what are we dealing with here, actually. Well, we're dealing with beers. We're dealing with reviews. We're dealing with some storage. It's probably an API, because it sounds like an API. And we also have the sample data to, um, to figure out. So these are the elements, like our context, that we're dealing with in this problem, in this app. It, so it kind of, this defines the world of this app. So if you were to formalize it a little bit more, you could start thinking about what everything is in this big world. So as a context, well, we know it's an HTTP API for adding beers. In terms of the language that we use to describe this app, or like our terminology, we can settle on beer review, let's call it repository or storage or database. Very often, you'll, you'll find three or five different words used to describe the same thing in the project. And then when you want to implement something new, you're then wondering, which one of the three or five words should I use? Like, which, which one did we settle on? The entities here is the HTTP server. The services that this app provides is adding a beer, adding a review, listing, either of those things. Our value objects, so the, the sort of objects that we're doing here is beers and reviews. Um, what are the possible events that we might have uh, happening in this app? Well, we might get like a beer added successfully or review added successfully. We can have a beer already exist if we're trying to add a duplicate. Beer not found if we're trying to list something that isn't there. In terms of storage or repositories, well, we, we know we need to store the beers somewhere and the reviews somewhere. And then in terms of sort of things that will let us manipulate this data, those value objects, we need uh, something to handle the beer aspect of things. So like a beer adder, a beer lister, a review adder, a review lister. So we kind of need those, um, those entities as well. So. For those of you who already are familiar with it, might have been getting some hints. Um, and also, uh, I thought that for it's very nice that you came here instead of uh, Sean's talk. But for those of you who are, feel like you're missing out on the Corgi gifts, I found this one last night. So I figured I'll stick it in here as the drum roll. Because what I just, um, what I just spoke about is something called DDD. What is DDD? Domain Driven Development. Um, Somebody told me about it randomly about a year ago. Uh, and then they told me about this book. This book is a brick, like this thick. Uh, and it's very academic, and it's very, very formal. But it's actually a pretty, like I, I thought it was a very intriguing idea for how you might start thinking about your apps. Um, so this is a classic book by Von Vernon. I encourage you to read it uh, to kind of get a full understanding. But I'll try and, um, I'll try and explain it. Uh, in a slightly shorter and less academic, academic way. So what is it about? It's about establishing your domain and the logic first. So before you write a single, single line of code, you just think about what are you dealing with. So what DDD is about is def uh, about defining what they call a bounded context um, and establishing the building blocks of your system. So is something a value object? Is something a re repository? What are, what are the things that we're dealing with? 
And you define a bounded, bounded, bounded context, which is basically a limit of a particular model. So like, if, if, like your beers might be one context, and then the review might be another context. And that kind of defines what has to be consistent within one context and what can just work independently. Um, and then you also define this thing called ubiquitous language, which is essentially your terminology. That you, so you, you set out and you set on a particular terminology to use across your project. And then DDD kind of distinguishes between the entities, the value objects, the main events, aggregates, all those things that I just mentioned. That's like formalized in the DDD model. So actually, before we jump into this, uh, let me just quickly show you an example way um, that you could go about implementing that. Um, this is obviously just my take on this. And the fun thing about DDD is that every one of us might have a slightly different idea for how to go about implementing this. So this is just what, I, what, I, what makes sense to me and how I would do it. But this is by no means just one way. So I've, I thought about this app this way. Well, we're going to have an adding package and then the review, a reviewing package. Um, and it's essentially, so DDD promotes this, this idea that you name your packages after the functionality that they provide and not after what they contain. So the functionality provided here is adding, listing, reviewing, but it doesn't, so the names aren't after what that package contains. Um, and I do have a package called beers and reviews, um, just to define the structs. And then the main, again, ties everything together. It looks pretty much the same. It's just like a slightly different way of initializing things. But you still add the sample data, still define your HTTP routes. Um, it's just that in your um, packages, for example, in the adding package, I have the endpoints. And now this is like separated. So this is just the HTTP layer. And then I also have the service, the actual business logic. So um, the add beer um, and add sample beers function. So it's kind of slightly more grouped. So this will be just the HTTP layer. This is the actual logic. Uh, and then storage is the actual implementation. So I just have the type for defining the type, but then this is the actual bit to deal with actual saving of things. Um, so this is kind of, if you do your code in this way, it's slightly easier to avoid circular dependencies because then you, the flow is slightly more clear. It's, it's slightly clearer because it starts at the main and then you kind of, the adding, the reviewing, the listing will depend on the storage, but then the storage won't, won't so much depend on this. So it's slightly easier to avoid circular dependencies when you start thinking about your apps this way, because you then start to think about the flow of control and information. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so like I said, this is just my take on it. Um, a few slight problems with it. If I wanted to suddenly add a different way of interacting with this app. So rather than an HTTP API, I would like to be, like, I'd like to, for this to be a command line app that would just prompt me for beers. Where do I then put that new client? Or maybe it's just like a, a completely new, a completely separate client that interacts with my application. So where, where would I put that in this project? And then the sample, sample data is still fairly ambiguous. It's now thrown into, so like the sample beers are defi defined here. And then in the actual adding service, you can add beer or add a sample beer. But it kind of doesn't feel quite right, because then you're just mixing the sample beers with the actual business logic. So oops, wrong way around. There is something that can take us one step further from here and help us a little bit with that with that dilemma, particularly about how you interact with your app. And this is something called the hexagonal architecture model. Um, this, is, this was invented, like invented, popularized by Alistair Cockburn, and it's pretty popular these days. Um, so what is this hexagon all about? Um, it has the core domain in the center. So the core domain is in here. And then it kind of starts to have layers that go outside. So you've got your application layer, your framework layers, and then at the very edges, it's all the third parties that you might be dealing with, the input, inputs and the outputs. So uh, you're, you're going to have your databases, maybe some third party services, third party parties API, all of the, all of the outside world. The, so the main application logic is here in the center. And like the goal of this model is, um, basically the goal of approaching the design this way is so that changes in one area of the app affect as little 
um, of the rest of the app as possible. So changes to your, ideally, changes to the core domain should only affect the core domain. They shouldn't change how you, your storage works. And equally, if you just want to swap out the storage, like if you want to swap out a MySQL database for a NoSQL database or something like that, you shouldn't necessarily touch your domain logic. Like your domain logic shouldn't really care how and where you save your data. Like it should have that abstracted. So the hex architecture as well, like I said before, like it treats the inputs and outputs as the external dependencies. It doesn't have like this, uh, this sort of um, it's basically completely asymmetric, uh, as opposed to the layered model, which kind of very clearly defines like the inputs and then the, the business logic and then the outputs like view. So this one just treats it all as kind of the same thing. Um, and then the key thing about the hexagonal motor is that dependencies are only allowed to point inwards. And that is a very key thing about this. Um, so the idea is that nothing from the core domain should depend on anything outside of it, but the things outside of it can by all means uh, use the things defined in the core domain. And that kind of makes sense from, a lot, from like the way you would think about your apps. So it kind of makes sense to group the, the actual core, core logic together and then just leave all the, every, everything else that can be swapped in and out, all the adapters, all the ports. That's why it's kind of called the ports and adapters sometimes. It makes sense to just leave it outside. Uh, and so the hex model achieves this by making a very heavy use of interfaces. So you pretty much define, define interfaces at every single uh, boundary between the layers. So the core domain is going to abstract everything it doesn't need to know about as interface, and it, it will kind of just go outwards. Um, so interfaces are very heavily used in this model. And if I... There we go. So to give you an example of how you might um, go about implementing that, it's actually very similar to the domain-driven uh, mo model, except for um, I now put two top-level uh, packages. So there is a package called command and a package called package, uh, PKG. And that's something that you might have noticed in some of the projects that are out there online. So the command package kind of defines the entry level into your app. So, you've got, so I've got my data sub-package and my server sub-package. Now I have two main functions. And one of them is for the actual server. So it just defines the endpoints as, as it did before. But now the adding of sample data is a completely separate command. So it's completely independent from the server, which kind of makes sense because that's how you would think about this app to start with. So now my main doesn't always add sample data when I run it. I only add sample data when I decide to, to run this main file. And then if I wanted to add a third-party client to call my app or a command line interface, uh, like entry into my app, I can just add another sub-package under my command package that just starts that or like lets me interact with my application in a different way. So it's very easy to add new uh, inputs to this. And then the package package um, contains the actual core logic, which doesn't isn't concerned with how this app is accessed or anything. It just it has the same functionality. So adding, listing, reviewing, none of that changed. Um, the storage package is outside of the package uh, of the PKG package because it isn't strictly um, sort of business domain. Um, it's probably debatable whether you'd put it all under the package, which is sort of supposed to be your actual source code for the application, or if you leave it outside. Um, I don't have a strong opinion on that. I think you could ar argue both ways. And then any other files, so like I've got a GoDep file in here, all of that is under the root uh, directory. So that's kind of how you could group this in a hex model. Um, looking at the package names, again, it tells you a little bit more about what this app does. So you look at, just by looking at the names, you know that you can add, you can list reviews. So I think that is a much nicer way to sort of convey what the app actually does and what you can do with it. And also looking at it, you kind of know that if you wanted to add something, you should probably look into the adding package. So it, it guides you along a little bit. Let me just come back to this. Uh, the hex model is probably an overkill for simple apps like this, like the beer add, adding package. I just kind of deliberately extended it. I still think that there's nothing wrong with flat files, but again, just to give you an idea, uh, it's kind of overcomplicated a little bit. So you might be thinking like, okay, that gets us into a pretty good state. Like it's a lot, a lot of a 
sort of a slightly big mind shift, maybe. Um, and that, is, that isn't even uh, everything that I found about the design yet. There's also something called the actor model. Um, and here's just like a quick Wikipedia definition. It treats actors as the universal, uh, universal primitives of concurrent computation. Um, and an actor essentially can make decisions, create more actors, send more messages, or determine how to respond to a message received. Uh, Actors may modify their own private states, but can only affect each other through messages, avoiding the need of any locks. That sounds an awful lot like some concurrency patterns that you might have heard about. So essentially, in the actor model, uh, every object is an actor with a mailbox and a behavior. And all actors communicate via messages. They're all independent. They can all work asynchronously. That's kind of the gist of it. Uh, there's also no shared state between the actors, which, again, fits fits the concurrent, concurrency model an awful lot um, and quite well. So I thought, well, OK, no shared state. That kind of invites concurrency quite a lot. Uh, and indeed, the, um, the author of DDD, Von, Vince Ver um, Von Vernon, he, he actually got it, um, quite involved into popularizing the actor model these days. And it's only been around for about, I think, since 2016. So it's a fairly recent trend. Um, and he reckons that the actor model is well suited for DDD and highly scalable systems and potentially simpler to implement than a typical event driven architecture. So, again, event driven architecture, probably some of you got that idea already. Um, so, I don't, I don't have an awful lot of time left to show you a full demo, but I did a quick demo of how you could go about that uh, for the adding of sample data. So essentially, what I've done is introduced some Go routines into the mix. And that kind of, uh, that actually is, you know, it feels finally like proper Go programming. Um, so the idea is essentially that our uh, beer adder and the re review adder, they're completely different actors. And they, are, they actually shouldn't affect each other because they don't care about each other. So there's no, there's no reason why we wouldn't run them as two Go routines, right? Like Go add beers, Go add reviews. And then obviously, the messages that we're going to pass into those actors are going to be the beer data and the review data. Um, so the way I've done it is, that's the wrong one. Um, in the adding service now defines the payload, which in the case of adding beers is just an array of beers. And in the case of adding reviews, it's an array of reviews. So that's the payload, payload that this actor might receive. And then there are some events that it might output. So it can just say, I'm done, I failed, or beer already exists. So that kind of defines the, the events that might be transported within. And then if you go back to the main, um, I've also thrown in some channels, because we need a way to know uh, when those Go routines finished. So you just pass in a channel for beers done and reviews done, um, kick off the Go routines, and then you just wait for those channels to return. And then if um, if we get the beers result, we just print out a simple summary of like finished with status blah. Uh, and then if you get the reviews done, then you just print out uh, finished adding reviews. So this is a very simple, um, simple thing, but it, I just, just kind of wanted to give you an idea for um, how you might go about defining those actors and events and messages in Go. And that hopefully looks a, a bit familiar, um, like, or looks familiar to you uh, if you've done things like worker pools or communicating with channels. It's essentially like the actor model is kind of formalizing what you might have already known uh, from Go programming. And I think that's why it fits Go quite well as a way to think about your apps. A quick word on uh, testing. Uh, I've not said it much about it so far. Um, I think the best thing is what the Go um, authors would probably recommend, which is just keep your test files next to your actual files. Um, I don't think there is a, much of a reason to duplicate your package structure in the test package. Um, I think it's perfectly fine to keep the tests, test files next to the main files. Um, I think it's also fine to use a shared mock sub package. I think that's what most people would recommend uh, these days. I personally haven't found a reason to not to. So I'd say keep a shared mock sub package. A quick word on naming. Um, I touched on this before. So I prefer my package names to convey what the package does than what it contains. It's a, it sort of helps you reason about the apps a bit more. Um, so choose the names that suggest well what can be expected inside. Avoid generic names like util or common, because that, that just ends up being the gigantic bag that you just throw stuff in. 
And then over time, it just grows and it just it sort of has stuff that doesn't fit anywhere else. It's just asking for trouble a little bit. There is a great talk by uh, Andrew Gerrand on the naming in Go, so I'd encourage you to go and like, flick through the slides. It's uh, published here. Um, and like I mentioned before, and that's the idiomatic Go, avoid stutter. So avoid ending up in a situation where you might have a beers.beer .beer or reviews.review. .review. Um, so same thing as strings reader, not a strings string reader. Just, it's even hard to say. Frameworks, you might, you might have been thinking, well, should I just use a framework? Is there a framework that would just do all of this for me? Um, yes and no. There are some frameworks out there, um, like GoBuffalo and GoKit and a bunch of others. They're, they're linked here at the top, just list, I think, eight or 10 uh, Go frameworks uh, from this year. Uh, so there are some frameworks out there. And I think it's worth checking them out to get some ideas, especially if you don't know where to get started. Uh, but obviously, then you have to stick to that framework structure. Uh, and personally, I preferred to learn and experiment with this from like fr first principles, so just do it all myself rather than stick to a framework, and then I'm kind of forced to keep to stick to a specific structure. Um, um, like I said, if you've been doing any other languages like PHPs and Rubies, you'll probably recognize the MVC pattern in most frameworks. Uh, the last link here is something called the Go Build template, which is kind of like a shortcut for creating um, the hex model. Uh, it will basically give you like a make file, a Docker file, a top level CMD package, and the package package, and then leave everything else for you to fill in. So I think that's actually quite a cool shortcut that you could use. Oops. So to sum up, putting it all together in Go. Um, I am a fan of the top-level directory structure, so the CMD for your binaries and inputs, and then package for the rest of your code. Uh, keep your domain types inside the root package, dependencies, so the third-party things like storage should ideally be in their own packages because you can then swap them in and out. Uh, mocks go in the shared sub-package. All the other files, like Docker files, your dependency management uh, files, anything else, I think it's fine to just stick it in the root directory. Um, the main package should be fairly small. So like the main.go function should be fairly small. It should just tie everything together uh, and then just initialize the app. Avoid global scope. Gets you into all sorts of trouble once you have multiple packages and you have to pass in a million dependencies between them. Uh, avoid init as well. Um, like the reason why I don't like init is, for example, if you put, like I put the uh, adding of sample data in init to start with, and then when I was writing my test and my test would run, the test would obviously run the init function every time, so I would add sample data every single time. So it kind of gets you into trouble very quickly because it will always run. I have to say that I have to give a huge credit to um, those people because none of these ideas is mine originally. This is what uh, Peter Bergen and Ben Johnson have been popularizing for a while as a way to write Go apps in 2018. So I highly recommend you check those links. Uh, they go into way more details and like, reasoning behind this. Marcus Olson as well, he's done a talk here at Golang UK, I think two years ago, where he um, talked about porting a sample DDE app from Java, which is like a famous DDD example, into Go. So this is a way more complicated app that he supported and kind of tried to illustrate DDD on that. Um, so again, I highly recommend that you check out his talk and his GitHub repo if you want to see a much more complicated example of DDD. So I'm sorry I don't have a single right answer. There is usually no single right answer to this. Um, I like the quote, be like water uh, by Bruce Lee. So be flexible with your structure. With your structure. Don't be afraid to experiment and adapt. Keep it as simple as possible, but not simpler. Um, keep it consistent. Uh, and share your ideas as well. If you, come across, if you just discover a really good way of structuring apps, or if you have a really good idea, then like Adidia said, uh, write blog posts about it, share your idea, get some feedback. Because um, I think we all, need, uh, we all need that, and we can all benefit from that. So that is all I have. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to tweet me. I will publish the slides and the code online. Um, and some references as well, like they're just a summary of the ones that I mentioned. So thank you for listening. Um.